Good morning. It is a joy to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Aiken, for that introduction and, and uh, for reading Jonah chapter 3. It's going to go very, very nicely with what we're looking at in Luke chapter 11. I'm going to focus uh, primarily on the verses 33 through 36, but really to get what Luke is doing, the way Luke unfolds this, we need to back up and sort of begin looking at verse 14. Because it's in verse 14 that Jesus cast the demons out of a mute man. And when he is able to then speak, uh, it says that there were three reactions to him. That there were those, it said the people marveled, but some said, oh, he's doing this by the power of Beelzebul. Others uh, said, oh, we need, we need a sign. You know, this is great that he did, but we need more. And so then you have progressively, Luke unfolds Jesus answering these three different categories. He begins with those that accuse him of casting demons out by the power of Beelzebul. And he attacks the logic of that. Well, how can Satan be divided against Satan? His house would not stand, it would fall. But he said, but if I by the finger of God cast them out, then the kingdom has come to you. And then down in verse 27, you have sort of a, the, the first category that Luke mentions is those that marveled. Here, a, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, Something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket. But on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Well, when you see this woman, this Middle Eastern woman who, she marvels at Jesus, she respects Jesus, he's obviously a prophet. She greets him with this very Middle Eastern greeting. Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. And, and she has great respect for Jesus. She's in a sense praising him, but notice Jesus' response to her is no, rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He, there's an implicit here warning about the danger of praising him without obeying him. The woman's statement is certainly completely accurate. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was blessed. Motherhood is a blessing, and, and to be the mother of Jesus is certainly immeasurably so. But Jesus' response is that hearing and keeping the word is better than bearing and nursing the Messiah. He contrasts the physical relationship which is great with the spiritual relationship, which is even better. It's, it's not enough to simply admire and marvel at Jesus. You've got to respond in obedience, he says. And then Luke has Jesus engage with the, the audience that wants a sign. And here you have the implicit danger of hearing without repenting. Jesus says, woe to this generation. This, this is an evil and adulterous generation because it's looking for a sign 
when God has in fact given one. You know, anytime you see in the scripture someone requesting a sign, that, it's always an evidence of the weakness of faith. Only Hezekiah is commanded to, to ask for a sign. When Gideon asked for a sign, I mean, I don't know about you, but if an angel showed up in my yard, I would consider that a sign. But Gideon wants another sign. And when he gets that sign, then he still wants another sign. And it's just evidence that he's not really wanting to obey God. His faith is weak. Here Jesus rebukes this generation because they're asking for a sign. I mean, he, he's been casting demons out. He's been feeding multitudes. He's, he's been giving miraculous catches of fish and calming the storm. And yet they go, hey, you know, we want a sign. Jesus says, the sign's already been given you. There's no sign that's going to be given you except the sign of Jonah. Now, what, what is the sign of Jonah? Well, when Jonah preached at Nineveh, he was a demonstration of God's judgment. Can you imagine what Jonah looked like after spending three days in the belly of a whale? The gastric juices, like just eating off the hair, uh, the hair off his flesh and bleaching his skin. When a guy whose skin is scarred and bleached and his hair is gone and he goes crossing your city talking about the judgment of God, you better listen to that guy. <laughs> he knows something about the judgment of God. Jonah was himself a demonstration of God's judgment, but he's also a demonstration of God's deliverance. Because God judged him for his disobedience, then God delivered him from the belly of that great fish and Jonah's testimony in Jonah 2 is, he concludes it all by saying, salvation is of the Lord. And when he lands, he heads now toward Nineveh. And there he preaches. He preaches the message of God's coming judgment. And he warns them of the wrath that is coming. And with that declaration of judgment, there comes then a demonstration of God's forgiveness. That God does what God always does. That when someone turns to him and repentance and faith, he, he forgives and he receives. And Nineveh repented at the demonstration of God's judgment and deliverance in Jonah. As he preached, they repented, they believed. So Jesus here says, there's no, there's no sign that's going to be given you except the sign of Jonah. And because that sign has been given and you have not repented, you've not done what the men of Nineveh did, I warn you that on the day of judgment, there's going to be a twofold testimony against you. The men of Nineveh are going to rise up in judgment of you and the queen of the south. We, we know her from 1 Kings and Chronicles as the, the queen of Sheba. And in 1 Kings, we're told that story of her coming. Now, we tend to think of this simply as a queen who is interested in Solomon's riches and his wisdom and his glory, and she comes to see how wise he is. But if you read the text carefully in 1 Kings chapter 10, it says, Now, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. See, at the heart of her interest in Solomon, at, at the heart of her questions testing Solomon, she wants to know about the name of the Lord. Who is Yahweh and what distinguishes him from all other gods? And when she sees the wisdom of Solomon, when Solomon answers her questions, uh, the, the writer goes on that when she heard the wisdom of Solomon, there was no more breath in her. Same phrase Rahab uses in Joshua when she tells how they heard about the exploits of the Israelites as they came up out of Egypt. She said, when, when we heard there was no breath left in any man, and her response to that was, your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Here the writer in 1 Kings 10 uses the same language of the queen of Sheba, that when she hears of Solomon's God, there is no breath left in her. And when she leaves, she says, blessed be the Lord, your God, blessed be Yahweh, your God, who has delighted in you and who has set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. He's made you his king. Here, Jesus is, 
is opening that text and explaining to us that the queen of the south, she heard, she, she knew this God, she trusted this God, she repented. And the men of Nineveh who heard the message and repented, and the queen of the south, neither of them descendants of Abraham, neither of them familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, but when they hear the preaching of the judgment of God and the name of God, they repent and they trust him and they're going to stand in judgment of you on the day and they're going to call you to account because you this generation seeking for a sign received the sign of Jonah but you did not believe it strikes me that there will come a day on that day when the Lord reveals himself in his glory that the glory of Jesus is so great and his majesty so brilliant that the thought of rejecting him will be so offensive that all those whom God in his grace has saved will rise up in judgment even of our dearest friends and closest loved ones who have denied the Lord of glory. The queen of the south, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment of you. Jesus is saying you need to repent of your unbelief. And then we get to verse 33. And at first glance, it looks like Luke has taken us in a different direction, that the subject has changed. Jesus is now talking about something completely different. But if you divorce those verses, 33 through 36, from what precedes it, it it really would make no sense at all. I mean, we, we could take verse 33 by itself. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who may enter may see the light. And our minds tend to sort of stick that back in the Sermon on the Mount where we've heard similar language. We're supposed to be salt and light, and this is talking about us shining. But suddenly, then Jesus changes the the metaphor. He says, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, when your eye is single, when it's whole, when it's undivided, then your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Now, what what is that about? How does that fit with what Jesus has just said? Well, here's Jesus telling this generation that though they marvel at him, Some accuse him of doing this by the power of the devil. Others say, now, this is wonderful, but we'd really like to see more evidence. We we want a sign. Jesus tells them, look, the sign has been given you. The sign of Jonah is here. And uh, he is saying that I am the light. I've not done these things in secret. These things aren't hidden. They're not done in a cellar or in a corner. I have preached in the light. I've done my miracles on a lampstand, as it were. My light is shining. Now, the question is not whether or not I, the light of God, am shining. The question is whether or not your eye will see me. And if your eye is single, if your eye is undivided, if your eye is healthy and you see me for who I am, then your whole body will be full of light. Jesus has not hidden himself. He's not done this in a corner. In fact, remember in verse 20, he says that I've done this by the finger of God. If I've done this by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And indeed, the kingdom has been brought right to them. And yet, seeing it and seeing the evidence of it, they still don't accept God's anointed. They still don't receive him as the son of God. Jesus is telling us that The eye is the center of perception. And the light that shines to us depends entirely on the focus, the health, the the singular focus, if you will, of the eye. And how we see Jesus determines whether our lives are full of light or full of darkness. I'm the kind of guy that finds what I like, and I stick with it. I I do not divert. 
I don't want to try something new. I know what I like. You know, uh, I have for my comfort shoes at, at home, you catch me around Buck Run, I'm wearing Crocs, not those plastic rubbery Crocs. I'm wearing canvas Crocs. They're called Walu Crocs. Now here's the problem. I, I learned that Crocs was, they stopped making them. So I, I went on eBay and Amazon and I bought like eight pair. <laughs> and my, in my closet, I've got them stacked. So when I wear one pair out, I just throw them away and I step into the next pair. And I don't need, I'm not looking for another comfort shoe. That is my comfort shoe. I, I don't need another one. And for my dress shoes, I wear Cole Hans. I, you find Cole Hahn, anything with the word grand in it. They've got Nike soles, the zero grand, lunar grand, grand 2.0, grand OS, grand 3.0. Now I get size 13 medium. That's what I wear. I, 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 if they look good, great. But man, when you're 59, it's all about how they feel. <laughs> I'm not wearing Johnston Murphy's. I'm not wearing floor shimes. I'm a Cole Hahn guy. That's what I want. When we go to a restaurant, if I've been there before, I'm getting the same thing I got the last time. If I liked it, I'm getting that again. I, I go to Longhorn. I get the outlaw ribeye. I, I go to Cracker Barrel. That's, of course, Uncle Herschel's favorite. That's what I'm getting, man. <laughs> and I, I know what I like. You know, we go to Serafini in, in Frankfurt. I get the hot brown. Tanya, my wife, is always encouraging me to be a little bit more adventurous. She says, Why don't you try something new? And I object to this. I say, don't you get it? This trait in me is what has kept me faithful to you for 38 years. <laughs> you should celebrate this in me. This should give you great comfort. And indeed, my eye for Tanya is a single eye. It is undivided. This word, hoplus, it's, it's only used twice. It's used here, and it's used in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus often uses the same images. He puts the same material in different sermons. Every preacher who's preaching a lot does exactly that. And uh, he says, your eye, the, the, the King James translates it single, if thine eye be single. I like that word. I think it's the right word. If, if your eye is without guile, if it's without deceit, if, it's, if it is in no way duplicitous, think of the word integer. You mathematicians, uh, you know an integer is what? It's a whole number. It's an undivided number. No fractions, no decimal points. It's a whole number. The word integrity comes from that same root. To have integrity is to be undivided. To, uh, a double-minded man is what? He's unstable in all of his ways. You don't, wanna, you don't put your trust in someone who speaks out of both sides of his mouth. And nobody wants to have double vision. We need to have a single eye, an, an eye that, that is completely focused. I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that I grew up in an era before the ubiquitous nature of internet pornography. Because what this has done is it has filled the minds of people, especially men, with thousands upon thousands of images, how can a man convince his wife that he has a single eye for her if he is filling his mind with pornography? And I'm aware, after serving with pastors and teaching in seminary, that this isn't limited to the pews. It's in the pastor's study as well. I, I'm so grateful. You know, my wife, Tanya, and I have been married 38 years. My eye is single for her. I, I'll just tell you, as she has aged, so has my taste in what a woman looks like. Whatever stage of life she is, that is my standard of beauty. 
And by the grace of God, I'm not filling my mind with thousands upon thousands of 20 year olds to compare her to. My eye is undivided. I have a singular focus on her. And in that singular, singular focus, there's, there's freedom, there's joy, there's delight, there's love. I, I want a single eye for Jesus. My knowledge of truth is distorted when my vision of Christ is divided between him and anything else. When anything else in my life beckons me, calls to me, when I desire something more than him, then my eye is not healthy. And not only is my body not filled with light, how great is the darkness. We have tragically seen the, the stepping away and the falling away of Christian leaders recently in many different ways and no doubt for many different reasons. But this I can say with absolute certainty, their eye was not single. Some perhaps began to look to human reasoning or to cultural pressure or to sinful temptation, but at some point they lost their focus on Christ and their eye became crossed and divided and double visioned and they looked to something else. You see, there are so many people that in ministry, they don't fail because uh, their life is so vile as much as so vain. It's not that they're pursuing horrible things. It's just that they're pursuing something other than Jesus. It, it can be something fairly innocuous. You can get caught up in video games. You can get caught up in online activity. You, you can get caught up in some hobby. It, it doesn't matter what it is, but if there's anything that is distracting you from the singular focus of glorifying Christ, your eye is not single and your body will not be filled with light. The need for the world's approval is a powerful and addictive drug. And when you begin thinking about how what you preach is going to play with the world and whether or not they're going to accept what you say and approve and when you begin to think of your preaching like not much more than an Instagram post and whether or not it's going to get likes, then ultimately that addiction is going to cause your spiritual veins to collapse and your spiritual heart will no longer beat and pump the blood through your spiritual veins, you, you, you die. Our culture is designed to pressure us. You measure your ministerial success by how many likes you get on your Instagram feed. We, we, we posture. And you know what, by the way, now we've, we've, we've risen, raised our, our uh, narcissism to an art form. If you, you don't like the way you look, you know, man, there's an app for that. Uh, you can post something that, you know, sort of uh, smooths out all your rough spots and, and makes you look some idealized version of yourself and post that. And this, honestly, can we believe that we're going to have a singular focus on Christ and preach truth when we care so much about what others think of us that the very thing that keeps us going in the day is seeing how many people like what we say or like how we look. Is your eye single? You know, uh, in Frankfurt, where I, I live, we get our water from the Kentucky River. And right now we're in something of a drought and the river has declined. And the water coming out of our tap Though we are told by the water company that it is safe to drink, it tastes terrible and it smells bad. I mean, taking a shower this morning, it smells like dirt coming out of the, of the faucet. So they say it's safe to drink, but nobody wants to drink it. So Tanya went out and bought gallons and gallons of drinking water. But here's the problem. I'm 
I like ice in my water. And so I got ice out of my ice maker and put it in my water bottle and then poured this bought water, this purified water in there. And that's not a single source. As the ice began to melt, my water began to taste and to stink like the Kentucky River. <laughs> it's, it's divided. You see, that's exactly the way Satan comes to us and he, he tempts us to... It's not that he wants us to outright reject Jesus, though rejection of Jesus is rejection of the light. There are many who don't outright reject Jesus. What they do is they reinvent him. I warn you, beware of the cringe factor. Is there some passage of the scripture that when you read it, it, it makes you cringe just a little bit? Maybe uh, something that Jesus says or does that causes you a little bit embarrassment in the, in the culture and the climate these days? Something maybe that needs your correction or clarification. I warn you, Jesus warns you, beware, your body is becoming full of darkness. How great is that darkness? Because you don't have a singular focus on Jesus and what he says. You're thinking about how it's going to play to the culture. Your, your vision determines your values. If you're looking at pornography, you're not looking at Jesus. If you're looking at what the culture thinks about you and the message, you are not looking at Jesus. When your eye beholds the light of Jesus, your whole life fills with his light, and then the light that shines into you is going to shine outward. It, this, is, this is the thing about what Jesus is saying, that he is the light, but your eye, the way you perceive Jesus, the way you receive Jesus is going to determine not only how that light comes into you, but then how it radiates out. If my eye is single for something I love, it's not just going to affect me inwardly, it's going to show outwardly. My son Seth is here. I can remember one day when Seth was a, uh, an older teenager, he pulled up in my driveway and he was driving a Mercedes convertible. And uh, I knew Seth couldn't afford a Mercedes convertible. I didn't know how he got it. He got out on the driver's side and uh, the top was up. I couldn't see in it. He came around to the passenger side. He opened the passenger door and out got this uh, teenage girl who was wearing a Catholic high school uniform. And I said, this is a Baptist preacher's nightmare right here. <laughs> well, I met the young lady and, and they dated for a while and she was not a believer. And uh, I told Seth, I don't think you should be dating her. She's not a believer. And at the time, he really wasn't listening to me. And uh, they dated for several months. Tony and I prayed for her. We, we talked to her. We opened our home to her. But I knew she's not a believer. She had, didn't seem to have any interest in being a believer. And I, I knew this was bad news. And so when they broke up, I was actually glad. I was relieved. But there was this gnawing concern in my heart for her soul. I got her email address and I, I sent her an email and, and I just poured my heart out to her and I tried to explain that our objection was never about you. You're a lovely young lady, but I said, even, even now, though, frankly, I'm glad that the two of you are no longer together. I, even now, I, I care for your soul and I, I would love for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And I just presented the gospel in that email. She never even responded. It was about three years later, the Lord had really done a great work in Seth's life. And Seth was really seeking to honor the Lord. And he came and talked to me one day. He said, do you remember that young lady? I said, yeah, I do. He said, uh, you know, uh, we, we, she got in touch with me and he said, uh, you know, she's a believer now. I said, oh, really? That's wonderful. He said, yeah, she's a member at, at Highview. And he said, uh, I'd, I'd like to go out with her. I said, well, you know, my objection was only that she was not a believer. I'm delighted to know she is. And I'm sure both of you have matured now. And, you know, I have no, no problem with it. And he went out with her that 
Next morning he came to see me and he said, uh, I'd really like you and mom to meet her again. I said, well, sure. He brought her over to our house and she walked in and I was just stunned. She was this elegant young woman. She was beautiful in every way and she had this dessert that she brought us. That always helps. And <laughs> uh, we just had a lovely evening and uh, she said, I guess you know I'm a Christian now. I said, well, I heard that. That's wonderful. I said, how did it happen? And she said, your email. She said, I was on vacation with my family in the Bahamas when I got your email. She said, I went into the bathroom and I got on my knees and I cried out to God and I put my faith and trust in Christ. When I came back, I Got, got in touch with a friend I knew was a Christian and she took me to Highview and I was baptized there and been discipled there and uh, the Lord's done a work in my life and that young woman is now the mother of four of my grandchildren man she's here today I want to show you something Stella come up here come up here now this is the prettiest sermon illustration in the history of alumni chapel <laughs> This is my granddaughter, Stella, whom I love dearly. She's our oldest grandchild. And Stella is wearing this lovely dress. You know what this is? I want you to see the Turn around, babe. Look at this. This was one of my shirts. <laughs> Thank you, dear. And Candace, her mom, takes my old shirts. I get ink stains on the pockets or something, you know, or a hole in the elbow. And she takes them and she reworks them and makes them into a dress. She calls them legacy dresses. And Harper's wearing one too. My, my uh, younger granddaughter sitting in Tanya's lap. She's wearing a, sh a dress that used to be my shirt. Now I want you to see something. When I look at Stella wearing this shirt that my daughter-in-law whom I got to lead to Christ via email. When I look at this, I see so much more than a dress. You see that? I see all that God has done in this whole story of his grace that has resulted in a daughter-in-law whom I could not love more if she were my own and had grown up in my home and grandchildren. And my daughter-in-law wants these dresses to remind my granddaughters of the legacy of their grandfather's faithfulness. Does it get better than that? Does it get better than that? Thank you, darling. Love you. Now, folks. Now here's my point. Did you see me light up when she started walking up here? The image of her going into me has to shine out, doesn't it? How much more when I look at Jesus? So that's the big question. How do you see him? Do you see someone who was confused about gender when he spoke in Matthew 19 and said, in the beginning, God created a male and female? Do you see an inveterate racist when he called the Syrophoenician woman a dog? There are people who see Jesus that way. Or do you just see a moral teacher who the early church elevated to the status of deity? Or do you see the one who is greater than Jonah? Do you see the one more glorious than Solomon? You know what I see when I look at Jesus? I see the one who took my filthy rags and he washed them as white as snow and he clothed me with his righteousness. How am I going to look at him? When you start talking about Jesus and what he's done for me and how he's enriched me and how he's promised me a place in heaven with him, my eyes are going to light up. My whole body is going to be full of light, looking at Jesus, feeding on his word, realizing what he has done. That is the command. If your eye is single, focused on Christ, your whole life is going to radiate his light. You know, the benefit of being a pastor at the same church for a long time is great. One of the, one of those things is that you walk through life with them and you're often in the very room with them at the end of life. Can I tell you something? 
at the end of your life, the chances are good. It's all going to get down to one room. All the stuff that you used to have, it's not going to matter. At the very end of life, it gets down to one room. And who and what is represented in that room is the only thing that's going to matter to you at the end of life. But if your eye has been single and focused on Jesus, and you can see into that room at the end of your life, your whole life will be full of light and death will be simply stepping into the presence of the source of the light that's been shining in you since you trusted him. That's how I want to live. That's how I want to die with a single eye. Father, I pray that we might be so focused on the Lord Jesus that Everything about us radiates his light and his glory to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.